All right, light comes in photons. Photons are little packets of energy. And the higher the frequency, the higher energy that little packet has. So I have a red laser that I'm shining on some phosphorescent paper, and you can see that it doesn't really do much to the paper. Now, if I bump up to a higher frequency, a green laser has a little bit shorter wavelength, you can see that that also doesn't do much to the paper. But if I bump up to a purple laser, now the paper glows. The reason why the paper glows is because purple photons have enough energy to excite the electrons in this paper. And then those electrons jump down from higher energy levels and they give off that light. They give it off as green light and we call that glowing. So if light was only a wave, only the brightness would matter, which is how tall the wave is. But since we also think of a light as a particle, the energy matters. So I think of these purple photons of light like bowling balls and the red ones like spitballs. Now, it doesn't matter how many spitballs I shoot at you, which is what we think of with the amplitude. That's like the number of photons. It doesn't matter how many spitballs hit those electrons. They never have enough energy to knock them up an energy level and make them give off light. This could be the world's brightest red light and it would never work. But a purple light, each photon has enough energy to kick those electrons up and make it glow. So different frequencies of light often are referred to as different colors. That's true for the visible spectrum of light. So we have Roy G. Biv, where red is the lowest frequency or the longest wavelength and violet is the highest frequency of the shortest wavelength. So here I have white light, which has all the frequencies of light kind of mixed together. And then red is 640 nanometers. Now we're moving down to shorter and shorter light. So when we get in the green, we're in this about 525 nanometers. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So if it was in scientific notation, it would be like 5.25 times 10 to the negative seventh meters or 525 billionths of a meter. As we get down towards 400 nanometers, that's about the very edge of what we can see, and that's violet light. So red is the very edge of what we can see at about 700 nanometers on one end, and then violet is the very edge of what we can see at about 400 nanometers on the other end. But there are lots and lots of different wavelengths of light that we can't see. Radio is the name for the longest wavelength of light. Then, after you go through radio, you get to microwaves. Then infrared is just before red. Then you have your Roy Biv. Then ultraviolet is just after violet. And then you have x-rays and gamma rays. And all of those different types of light are really the same thing. They're alternating electric and magnetic fields. Right, that's okay, I want to talk a little bit about electromagnetic waves, but it's kind of hard for me to draw what's happening. So I have a picture from the, the uh, G. and Coley physics book. So if you have an antenna, you have a positive and a negative, and the electricity is going to be flowing, the, the conventional current they say is flowing away from positive and towards negative. So that's what that I arrow means. All right, in that long wire, which an antenna usually is, especially for radio waves, you have an electric field. In this case, the electric field is pointing upward, right? Well, you could use the right-hand rule with the direction of current, and you'd find out the magnetic field is going into the page. If you pointed your thumb upward, your fingers would be curling into the page. And so that's why you see those X's there. So you can think of the, the electric field as red and the magnetic field as blue, and they are perpendicular to each other. All right, well, then what we're going to do is we're going to switch the direction of electricity. And so now the electric field is going the opposite way, and the magnetic field becomes dots instead of Xs. Right, so the frequency at which we switch that direction is going to be the frequency 
at which the waves switch. So you're gonna get crests and troughs, like a transverse wave, because you're gonna be going from electric field up to electric field down to electric field up to electric field down. Magnetic field in to magnetic field out to magnetic field in to magnetic field out. So if you look at this picture here, they've represented the electric field with red and the magnetic field with blue. And you can see that they crest at the same time. So the, the electric field is strongest, as you would think, when the magnetic field is strongest. And that is a self-propelled transverse wave called an electromagnetic wave, which is what light is, that pushes itself through space at 300 million meters per second, or 186,000 miles per second, or seven times around the Earth in one second. And all light, radio, micro, infrared, Roy G. Biv, ultraviolet, extra gamma ray, is all that stuff. So the only difference is the antenna, so to speak, changes its direction maybe more frequently to make the waves have a higher frequency. And because they all have to travel at the same speed, when they get a higher frequency, they automatically get a shorter wavelength because the speed is the frequency times the wavelength. Just like in last unit, V equals F lambda. In this unit, we're gonna use the symbol C for the speed of light. So it's gonna be C equals F lambda. So if you know the frequency, you can automatically know the wavelength. Now, it's impossible to make an antenna at some of the high frequencies of things like ultraviolet, X-ray, uh, with electrons flowing one way and then blowing the other. So it might be more like the vibration of electrons uh, or the excitement of electrons in atoms that makes the types of light. So how do we know that light moves at 300 million meters per second? Well, we didn't for a long time. Actually, they thought maybe the speed of light was infinite. And one of the first people to figure it out in the 1600s was Olaus Romer, an astronomer. So we had been studying the moons of Jupiter and one of the moons, Io, was kind of curious in that it would have a period of going around Jupiter, kind of like our moon has a period of going around the Earth that our moon takes 28 days about. Well, Io, they were measuring how long it takes to go around Jupiter, and sometimes it seemed like it was late. Like, I don't know if it got sidetracked on the backside or what happened, but somehow it would be late popping out the other side of Jupiter. And so they thought, does it have an irregular period or why is it late sometimes? It was like 22 minutes late. Well, they started looking at when was it late? And they realized that sometimes Jupiter was on the far side of its orbit compared to the Earth. So if you can just picture the sun here and the Earth orbiting, maybe Jupiter, you know, two more planets out, would be on this side of its orbit and so when that moon came around the backside and all of a sudden, let's pretend like the sun's not in the way, we, we can see that moon re-emerging. It takes the light longer to get to us from Jupiter because Jupiter is a far, far distance away compared to when we're more lined up and Jupiter's on the same side of its orbit. Now that moon is going around Jupiter and we can see it light travel to us much quicker. So it wasn't the moon Io that was late. It was light that was late because light had so far to go. In fact, we've since found out that it takes light eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth. So if the sun were to disappear, we wouldn't really know about it for eight minutes. So how do we get a more exact speed? Well, there was a American scientist named Albert Michelson, and he did this experiment um, between Mount Wilson and I think it was maybe Mount San Antonio in California. And he had, this is gonna be kind of a crude drawing, a octagonal, let's see how well I can do it in the octagon. Oh yeah, perfect. An octagonal mirror, and he would shine the light in to the mirror, and then would go to the far mountain, hit a mirror, come back, and if the mirror wasn't moving, 
it would go right into this eyepiece so that you could detect the light. Law of reflection. Right? Well, if he started this mirror rotating, if it makes exactly one-eighth of a turn during the time it takes the light to go down and back, then you know the time it took for the light to travel this distance. Well, this was 35 kilometers, or about 22 miles between these mountains. So it really went 70 kilometers in the time for one-eighth of a cycle. So if you could figure out the RPMs, you could figure out how long a whole revolution would take, then you could divide that by eight and you get the time. And that's how we came up with the current number that we use for, for C, 300 million meters per second is C. So we use the equation C equals F times lambda. So when we're looking at visible light and we're saying, oh, we can see um, something like 400 nanometers. So three times 10 to the eighth equals F times 400 nanometers. Now that is the shortest wave we can see, which is four times 10 to the negative seventh meters. So if you take three times 10 to the eighth and you divide it by four, times 10 to the negative seventh, I think you're gonna get something like 7.5 times 10 to the 14th hertz, which is about what violet light's frequency is. So that's how you solve for the frequency of light with different equations.